Over the last couple of lessons, what we've been doing is talking about the build-up to the situation that we find ourselves with at the end of, the, uh, of 1914 with this First World War, focusing on this idea that we go from a relatively fast pace and, uh, and fast-moving conflict to this of a stalemate and the development of trench warfare, and that this stalemate will essentially continue and set in and, and be the case for the majority of the conflict, at least especially on the Western Front. So what we're going to do in this lesson is talk in more detail about this concept of trench warfare and the way it worked, how things operated, the kind of tactics that were used during the First World War, especially within the trench system, and essentially what life was like for a soldier living in the trench system. Now, the first thing I should mention is that there is a common perception that the trench system during World War I was incredibly unpleasant. Now, while this was the case, that this was definitely a, a, a true statement, there's a little bit more to it than that. There's a little bit more to it than, than just this idea that it was incredibly unpleasant. We'll talk about how unpleasant it was, but then we'll also focus on some of the more realistic aspects of the system that existed and um, the ways in which the life of a soldier would change during the First World War. So, essentially, the concept of the development of trenches and the development of a trench warfare system almost forced upon those in positions of military authority um, because the the problem that was had was their tactics and the use of infantry would have to change dramatically because this idea of a trench warfare system was relatively new it had never actually taken place and occurred in any major conflict before in this kind of way or at least to the scale and the extent to which it was uh, 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 it was accentuated during the first world war and so therefore the common perception and the common understanding of what cavalry is used for and what infantry is used for had to change because we have to adapt to this new style of fighting so essentially the utilization of uh, the the for forward push the frontal charge uh, would be uh, placed on the shoulders of the infantry rather than that of cavalry previously you had the idea of the cavalry charge and now we have this idea of an infantry charge which was not necessarily something that was invented during the first world war but was something that was uh, utilized a lot heavier than that of the cavalry during the first world war owing to the fact that we have this new development in trench warfare so we looked at this in the last lesson. So we looked at this idea of going over the top and the process uh, that was had in trying to gain ground during the First World War and trying to gain other trenches during the First World War. The idea that it would begin with a military barrage, an artillery barrage, shall I say, and then it would go to the idea of going over the top. And then the big challenge would be not only trying to go through no man's land and trying to actually be successful in that endeavor but then also the uh, problem of being able to hold the trench that you have just taken which was obviously very difficult now the traditional historical view is that military generals would simply throw individuals into the line of fire with the belief that the more people that they had and the more people that would charge a trench uh, uh, through infantry uh, the more likely they were going to gain ground now this is technically true in the sense that the more people that you have um, within an infantry charge uh, does lead to a likelier chance that you're going to actually take said trench but Again, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And this traditional view of the uh, ways in which military generals uh, viewed the concept of trench warfare isn't entirely accurate. Because in reality, generals didn't just throw people at the line of fire uh, to try and be able to, um, to, to, to capture ground. In reality, they would increasingly find new and more inventive ways of making tactical changes to gain an advantage. They didn't just spend the whole entirety of the First World War, four years, throwing soldiers at each other and then uh, leading to uh, horrendous numbers of deaths. Instead, they would instead actually talk about and think about the tactical changes that they could um, implement to gain some kind of military advantage and some kind of tactical advantage over the enemy. One such example of a tactical advantage was the idea of sapping. Now, sapping... Uh, 
predates the use of uh, uh, well, it predates gunpowder conflicts. In fact, so it, it predates any kind of uh, warfare that had guns and 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 the, the kind of modern technological advances. So it predates the First World War. It predates a lot of conflicts. Um, and essentially, what the practice of sapping was was that of digging um, under covered trenches uh, uh, and essentially trying to uh, dig towards besieged positions in order to gain some kind of advantage. How it was utilized in the second, in the first world war, should I say, it was the process of digging under no man's land and under enemy trenches. And what they would do there, if they were under dug under the de the enemy trenches, they would then place mines and other explosives there and blow up the trench from underneath. This is what the process of sapping was. Now, the people and the individuals who were uh, utilized for the purposes of sapping were often ex-miners who were rejected from conscription due to either ill health or potentially due to the fact that they were um, too old. And so therefore, that you know, were not going to conscript into the normal military. And so they were utilized instead for their mining uh, prowess, essentially. So for their ability to uh, dig tunnels effectively and to do so under the enemy uh, territories. It was an incredibly stressful job, as you can probably imagine, because at any time the tunnel would collapse uh, or they, they could be detected by enemy forces. Of course, if you are digging a tunnel underneath individuals who are the enemy you might be making noise in doing so and you have to be very very quiet in doing so and there was also this idea that they were also digging tunnels in the opposite direction so you might end up running into each other along the way causing a lot of conflict uh, within the tunnel itself so sapping wasn't a particularly pleasant um, job for any individual in the first world war to have not that any job was particularly pleasant in any way um and it would also be noted that this is an example of a tactical change or a tactical maneuver to try and gain an advantage that was not just throwing hurls of, of, of soldiers at the enemy. It was an example here of using um, different tactical changes to try and gain some kind of advantage that would save lives rather than just throwing more and more soldiers at a particular line of fire. Now, the trenches themselves were not particularly um, nice places to be either. So, for example, in the summer, the smells in the trenches would become unbearable. There are obviously a number of different reasons for this. We have the fact that there was the close proximity of men and horses living together in these uh, un um, sanitated uh, unsanitary uh, lo uh, locations you have the lack of effective plumbing as you can probably imagine they didn't um, put in uh, t two sophisticated plumbing techniques in the trenches uh, there was also and the main factor here was of course the smell of rotting corpses considering the fact that this was the front line of a major conflict and there would be dead people here there and everywhere so that was what it was like in the summer it's not particularly um, a nice place to be and a very smelly place to be. And then in the winter, things were not particularly uh, much better. So in the winter and in uh, wet periods as well, so not necessarily just the winter, but also um, in the kind of autumn period as well, um, soldiers would consistently get a condition known as trench foot. And it was a condition that would be developed through the process of standing in water for potentially days on end. So having your feet exposed to uh, moisture for so long um, causes uh, trench foot. Now, one of the things that the, the soldiers would do to prevent trench foot or to try and reduce the chances of getting trench foot would be to uh, assign themselves another soldier. So you'd be uh, almost paired up in pairs and it would be the responsibility of the other soldier to check your feet uh, for making sure that they didn't have trench foot. The idea was that you are more likely to check it if you're responsible for another individual rather than being responsible for yourself. And so therefore that is how they try to uh, alleviate the condition of trench foot. Now, trench foot was a condition that um, can develop and not be necessarily that severe in some instances, and then in other instances can be absolutely horrific. So, of course, it was very important that people didn't um, try, uh, didn't have trench foot during the First World War. And then we also have the problem of the fact that they were outside for long durations of time, and in doing so, they would get so cold that soldiers would often get frostbite, and again, causing a number of major problems as well.